The assassination of John F. Kennedy on November 22, 1963 has spurred numerous conspiracy theories, which include accusations of involvement of the CIA, the Mafia, sitting Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson, Cuban Prime Minister Fidel Castro, the KGB, or even some combination thereof. Some conspiracy theories further claim that the United States federal government covered up crucial information in the aftermath of the assassination. Former Los Angeles District Attorney Vincent Bugliosi estimated that a total of 42 groups, 82 assassins, and 214 people had been accused at one time or another in various conspiracy scenarios. In 1964, the Warren Commission concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald was the only person responsible for assassinating Kennedy. In 1979, the United States House Select Committee on Assassinations HSCA concluded that Kennedy was probably assassinated as a result of a conspiracy, although it did not identify any individuals or groups other than Oswald. The HSCA reasoned that a second gunman probably also fired at Kennedy, but acoustic evidence that the HSCA accepted in reaching its conclusions was later discredited by another set of experts. Other federal and municipal investigations have been conducted, most of which support the conclusions reached in the Warren Commission report. Nonetheless, a majority of Americans polled indicated a belief in some sort of conspiracy. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Background. President John F. Kennedy was assassinated by gunshot while traveling in a motorcade in an open-top limousine in Dallas, Texas at 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time on Friday, November 22, 1963. Texas Governor John Connolly was wounded, but survived. Within two hours, Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested for killing Dallas policeman J.D. Tippett and arraigned that evening. Shortly after 1.30 a.m. on Saturday, November 23, Oswald was arraigned for murdering President Kennedy as well. On Sunday, November 24, at 11.21 a.m., nightclub owner Jack Ruby fatally shot Oswald as he was being transferred from the city jail to the county jail. Immediately after the shooting, many people suspected that the assassination was part of a larger plot, and broadcasters speculated that Dallas right-wingers were involved. Ruby's shooting of Oswald compounded initial suspicions. Among conspiracy theorists, author Mark Lane has been described as writing, "...the first literary shot," with his article, "...defense brief for Oswald." in the National Guardian's December 19, 1963 issue. Thomas Buchanan's Who Killed Kennedy, published in May 1964, has been credited as the first book to allege a conspiracy. In 1964, the Warren Commission concluded that Oswald had acted alone and that no credible evidence supported the contention that he was involved in a conspiracy to assassinate the president. The commission also indicated that then-Secretary of State Dean Rusk, then-Defense Secretary Robert S. McNamara, then-Treasury Secretary C. Douglas Dillon, then-Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, then-FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, then-CIA Director John A. McCone, and then-Secret Service Chief James J. Rowley, each individually reached the same conclusion on the basis of information available to them. During the trial of Clay Shaw in 1969, however, New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison challenged the single bullet theory with evidence from the Zapruder film, which he claimed indicated that a fourth shot from the grassy knoll had caused the fatal shot to Kennedy's head. In 1979, the United States House Select Committee on Assassinations HSCA agreed with the Warren Commission that Oswald did, in fact, assassinate Kennedy, but concluded that the Commission's report and the original FBI investigation were seriously flawed. The HSCA concluded that at least four shots were fired with a high probability 
that two gunmen fired at the president, and that a conspiracy to do so was probable. The HSCA stated that the Warren Commission had failed to investigate adequately the possibility of a conspiracy to assassinate the president." The Ramsey-Clark panel and the Rockefeller Commission both supported the Warren Commission's conclusions. The last remaining documents under Section 5 of the President John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Collection Act of 1992 were released on October 26, 2017, while the remaining ones that are still classified will only be analyzed for redactions. <laughs> Public opinion According to author John C. McAdams, T. He greatest and grandest of all conspiracy theories is the Kennedy assassination conspiracy theory. Others have often referred to it as the mother of all conspiracies. The number of books written about the assassination of Kennedy has been estimated to be between 1,000 and 2,000. According to Vincent Bugliosi, 95% of those books are pro-conspiracy and anti-Warren Commission. Author David Krychik describes Kennedy assassination enthusiasts as people belonging to conspiracy theorists on one side and debunkers on the other. The great amount of controversy surrounding the event has resulted in bitter disputes between those who support the conclusion of the Warren Commission and those who reject it, or are critical of the official explanation with each side leveling toward the other accusations of naivete, cynicism, and selective interpretation of the evidence. Public opinion polls have consistently shown that most Americans believe there was a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. However, on the question of a government cover-up, different polls show both a minority and a majority of Americans who believe the government was engaged in one. These same polls also show no agreement on who else may have been involved in the shooting. A 2003 Gallup poll reported that 75% of Americans don't believe that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. That same year an ABC News poll found that 70% of respondents suspected that the assassination involved more than one person. A 2004 Fox News poll noted that 66% of Americans thought there had been a conspiracy while 74% believed that there was a cover-up. As recently as 2009, some 76% of people polled for CBS News said they believed the president had been killed as the result of a conspiracy. A Gallup poll from 2013 found that 61% of Americans, the lowest figure in nearly 50 years, believed other people besides Oswald were involved. <laughs> Possible evidence of a cover-up Numerous researchers, author Mark Lane, Henry Hurt, Michael L. Kurtz, Gerald D. McKnight, Anthony Summers, and Harold Weisberg, have pointed out what they characterize as inconsistencies, oversights, exclusions of evidence, errors, changing stories, or changes made to witness testimony in the official Warren Commission investigation, which they say could suggest a cover-up. Michael Benson wrote that the Warren Commission received only information supplied to it by the FBI, and that its purpose was to rubber stamp the lone gunman theory. United States Senator and U.S. Senate Select Committee on Intelligence member Richard Schweiker told author Anthony Summers in 1978 that he believed D that the Warren Commission was set up at the time to feed pabulum to the American public for reasons not yet known, and that one of the biggest cover-ups in the history of our country occurred at that time." James H. Fetzer took issue with a 1998 statement from Federal Judge and Assassination Records Review Board Chairman John R. Tunheim, who stated that no smoking guns 
indicating a conspiracy or cover-up were discovered during their efforts in the early 1990s to declassify documents related to the assassination. Fetzer identified 16 smoking guns that he claims prove the official narrative is impossible, and therefore a conspiracy and cover-up occurred. He also claims that evidence released by the ARRB substantiates these concerns. These include problems with bullet trajectories, the murder weapon, the ammunition used, inconsistencies between the Warren Commission's account and the autopsy findings, inconsistencies between the autopsy findings and what was reported by witnesses at the scene of the murder, eyewitness accounts that conflict with X-rays taken of the president's body, indications that the diagrams and photos of the president's brain in the National Archives are not the president's, testimony by those who took and processed the autopsy photos that the photos were altered, created, or destroyed, indications that the Zapruder film had been tampered with, allegations that the Warren Commission's version of events conflicts with news reports from the scene of the murder, an alleged change to the motorcade route that facilitated the assassination, an alleged lax secret service and local law enforcement security, and statements made by people who claim that they had not knowledge of, or participated in, a conspiracy to kill the president. In 1966, Roscoe Drummond voiced skepticism about a cover up in his syndicated column, saying, If there were a conspiracy to cover up the truth about the assassination, it would have to involve the Chief Justice, the Republican, Democratic, and non party members of the Commission, the FBI, the CIA, the Secret Service, the distinguished doctors of the armed services and the White House—a conspiracy so multiple and complex that it would have fallen of its own weight. <laughs> <laughs> Allegations of witness tampering, intimidation, and foul play <laughs> Alleged witness intimidation Richard Beyer wrote that many witnesses whose statements pointed to a conspiracy were either ignored or intimidated by the Warren Commission. In JFK, The Last Dissenting Witness, a 1992 biography of Jean Hill, Bill Sloan wrote that Warren Commission Assistant's counsel Arlen Specter attempted to humiliate, discredit, and intimidate Hill into changing her story. Hill also told Sloan that she was abused by Secret Service agents, harassed by the FBI, and received death threats. A later book by Sloan, JFK, Breaking the Silence, quotes several assassination eyewitnesses as saying that Warren Commission interviewers repeatedly cut short or stifled any comments casting doubt on the conclusion that Oswald had acted alone. In his book Crossfire, Jim Mars gives accounts of several people who said they were intimidated by either FBI agents or anonymous individuals into altering or suppressing what they knew regarding the assassination. Some of those individuals include Richard Carr, Aquila Clemens, Sandy Speaker, and A.J. Milliken. Mars also wrote that Texas School Book Depository employee Joe Molina was intimidated by authorities and lost his job soon after the assassination," and that witness Ed Hoffman was warned by an FBI agent that he "...might get killed," if he revealed what he observed in Dealey Plaza on the day of the assassination. <laughs> <laughs> witness deaths Allegations of mysterious or suspicious deaths of witnesses connected with the Kennedy assassination originated with Penn Jones Jr., and were brought to national attention by the 1973 film Executive Action. Jim Mars later presented a list of 103 people he believed died, "...convenient deaths," under suspicious circumstances. He noted that the deaths were grouped around investigations conducted by the Warren Commission, New Orleans D.A. Jim Garrison, the Senate Intelligence Committee, and the House Select Committee on Assassinations. 
Mars pointed out that, "...these deaths certainly would have been convenient for anyone not wishing the truth of the JFK assassination to become public." In 2013, Richard Belzer published Hit List, an in-depth investigation into the mysterious deaths of witnesses to the JFK assassination that examines the deaths of 50 people linked to the assassination and claims they were murdered as part of a cover-up. Vincent Bugliosi described the death of journalist Dorothy Kilgallen, who said she was granted a private interview with Jack Ruby, as perhaps the most prominent mysterious death," cited by assassination researchers. According to author Jerome Croth, Mafia figures Sam Giancana, John Roselli, Carlos Prio, Jimmy Hoffa, Charles Nicoletti, Leo Mocheri, Richard Kane, Salvatore Granello, and Dave Yaras were likely murdered to prevent them from revealing their knowledge. According to author Matthew Smith, others with some tie to the case who have died suspicious deaths include Lee Bowers, Gary Underhill, William Sullivan, David Ferry, Clay Shaw, George de Morenschild, four showgirls who worked for Jack Ruby, and Ruby himself. The House Select Committee on Assassinations investigated another alleged mysterious death that of Rose Cheremy. The committee reported that Louisiana State Police Lt. Francis Fruge traveled to Eunice, Louisiana, on November 20, 1963—two days before the assassination—to pick up Cheremy, who had sustained minor injuries when she was hit by a car. Fruge drove Cheremy to the hospital and said that on the way there, she related to him that she was coming from Florida to Dallas with two men who were Italians or resembled Italians." Fruge asked her what she planned to do in Dallas, to which she replied, Number one, pick up some money, pick up my baby, and kill Kennedy. Cheremy was admitted and treated at State Hospital in Jackson, Louisiana for alcohol and heroin addiction. State Hospital physician Dr. Victor Weiss later told a House Select Committee investigator that on November 25—three days after the assassination—one of his fellow physicians told him that Cheremy had stated before the assassination that President Kennedy was going to be killed. Dr. Weiss further reported that Cheremy told him after the assassination that she had worked for Jack Ruby and that her knowledge of the assassination originated from word in the underworld. After the assassination, Lt. Fruge contacted Dallas Police Captain Will Fritz regarding what he had learned from Cheremy, but Fritz told him he wasn't interested. Cheremy was found dead by a highway near Big Sandy, Texas, on September 4, 1965. She had been run over by a car. Another suspicious death cited by Jim Mars was that of Joseph Miltier, director of the Dixie Clan of Georgia. Miltier was secretly tape recorded 13 days before the assassination telling Miami police informant William Somerset that the murder of Kennedy was in the working. Miltier died in 1974 when a heater exploded in his house. The House Select Committee on Assassinations reported in 1979 that Miltier's information on the threat to the president was furnished to the agents making the advance arrangements before the visit of the president to Miami, but that the Miltier threat was ignored by Secret Service personnel in planning the trip to Dallas." Robert Bauck, special agent in charge of the Secret Service's Protective Research Section, testified that, "...threat information was transmitted from one region of the country to another if there was specific evidence it was relevant to the receiving region." The House Select Committee on Assassinations investigated the allegation that a statistically improbable number of individuals with some direct or peripheral association with the Kennedy assassination died as a result of that assassination, thereby raising the specter of conspiracy. The committee's chief of research testified, 
Our final conclusion on the issue is that the available evidence does not establish anything about the nature of these deaths which would indicate that the deaths were in some manner, either direct or peripheral, caused by the assassination of President Kennedy or by any aspect of the subsequent investigation. Author Gerald Posner said that Mars's list was taken from the group of about 10,000 people connected even in the most tenuous way to the assassination, including people identified in the official investigations, as well as the research of conspiracy theorists. Posner also said that it would be surprising if a hundred people out of 10,000 did not die in unnatural ways. He noted that over half of the people on Mars's list did not die mysteriously, but of natural causes, such as Secret Service agent Roy Kellerman, who died of heart failure at age 69 in 1984, long after the Kennedy assassination, but is on Mars's list as someone whose cause of death is unknown. Posner also pointed out that many prominent witnesses and conspiracy researchers continue to live long lives. Topic. Allegations of evidence suppression, tampering, and fabrication Allegations saying that the evidence against Oswald was either planted, forged, or tampered with has been a main argument among anybody who believe a conspiracy has taken place. Topic. Suppression of evidence Topic. Ignored testimony Some assassination researchers assert that witness statements indicating a conspiracy were ignored by the Warren Commission. In 1967, Josiah Thompson stated that the Commission ignored the testimonies of seven witnesses who saw gun smoke right by the stockade fence on the grassy knoll as well as an eighth witness who smelled gunpowder by the time the assassination occurred. In 1989, Jim Mars wrote that the Commission failed to ask for the testimonies of witnesses on the triple underpass whose statements pointed to a shooter on the grassy knoll. <laughs> Confiscated film and photographs other researchers reported that witnesses who captured the assassination via photographs or film had their cameras confiscated by police or other authorities. Author Jim Mars and documentary producer Nigel Turner both presented the account of Gordon Arnold who said that his film of the motorcade was taken by two policemen shortly after the assassination. Another witness, identified as Beverly Oliver, came forward in 1970 and said she was the babushka lady who was seen, in the Zapruder film, filming the motorcade. She also said that after the assassination, she was contacted at work by two men who she thought were either FBI or Secret Service agents. According to Oliver, the men told her that they wanted to develop her film and return it to her within ten days, but they never did so. <laughs> <laughs> Withheld documents Richard Beyer and others have complained that many documents pertaining to the assassination have been withheld over the years, including documents from investigations made by the Warren Commission, the House Select Committee on Assassinations, and the Church Committee. These documents individually included the President's autopsy records. Some documents still are not scheduled for release until 2029. Many documents were released during the mid to late 1990s by the Assassination Records Review Board (ARRB) under the President John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Collection Act of 1992. However, some of the material released contains redacted sections. 
tax return information, which identified employers and sources of income, has not yet been released. The existence of several secret documents related to the assassination, as well as the long period of secrecy, suggests to some the possibility of a cover up. One historian noted, there exists widespread suspicion about the government's disposition of the Kennedy assassination records stemming from the beliefs that federal officials one, have not made available all government assassination records even to the Warren Commission, Church Committee, House Assassination Committee and two, have heavily redacted the records released under FOIA in order to cover up sinister conspiracies. According to the ARRB, all Warren Commission records, except those records that contain tax return information, are now available to the public with only minor redactions. In response to a Freedom of Information Act request filed by journalist Jefferson Morley, the CIA stated in 2010 that it had over 1,100 documents in relation to the assassination, about 2,000 pages in total, that have not been released due to national security-related concerns. Topic: <laughs> Tampering with evidence. Some researchers have alleged that various items of physical evidence have been tampered with, including the single bullet, also known as the magic bullet. By some critics of official explanations, various bullet cartridges and fragments, the presidential limousine's windshield, the paper bag in which the Warren Commission said Oswald hid the rifle, the so called backyard. Photos depicting Oswald holding the rifle, the Zapruder film, the photographs and radiographs obtained at Kennedy's autopsy, and the president's dead body itself. Photographs <laughs> 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 Among the evidence against Oswald are photographs of him holding a Carcano rifle. The weapon identified by the Warren Commission as the assassination weapon in his backyard. The House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded that the Oswald photos are genuine, and Oswald's wife, Marina, said that she took them. In 2009, the journal Perception published the findings of Haney Farid, a professor in the Department of Computer Science at Dartmouth College, who used 3D modeling software to analyze one of the photographs. After demonstrating that a single light source could create seemingly incongruent shadows, Farid concluded that the photograph revealed no evidence of tampering. Many researchers, including Robert Grodin, assert that these photos are fake. In 1979, after the HSCA had disbanded, Grodin said that four autopsy photographs showing the back of Kennedy's head were forged to hide a wound fired from a second gunman. According to Grodin, a photograph of a cadaver's head was inserted over another depicting a large exit wound in the back of the president's head. HSCA Chief Counsel G. Robert Blakey, in response to the allegations, stated that the "...suggestion that the committee would participate in a cover-up is absurd," and that Grodin was "...not competent to make a judgment on whether or not a photograph has been altered." Blakey stated that the photographic analysis panel for the committee had examined the photographs and that they considered everything Grodin had to say and rejected it. Topic: The Zapruder film. The House Select Committee on Assassinations described the Zapruder film as the best available photographic evidence of the number and timing of the shots that struck the occupants of the presidential limousine." The Assassination Records Review Board said it, "...is perhaps the single most important assassination record." According to Vincent Bugliosi, the film was originally touted by the vast majority of conspiracy theorists as incontrovertible proof of a conspiracy 
but is now believed by many assassination researchers to be a sophisticated forgery. Among those who believe that the Zapruder film has been altered are John Costella, James H. Fetzer, David Lifton, David Mantic, Jack White, Noel Twyman, and Harrison Livingstone, who has called it the biggest hoax of the 20th century. In 1996, former Kodak product engineer Roland Zavada was requested by the Assassination Records Review Board to undertake a thorough technical study of the Zapruder film. Zavada concluded that there was no detectable evidence of manipulation or image alteration on the film's original version. David Lifton wrote that the Zapruder film was in the possession of the CIA's National Photograph. Photographic Interpretation Center by the night of the assassination. Jack White, researcher and photographic consultant to the House Select Committee on Assassinations, claimed that there were anomalies in the Zapruder film, including an unnatural jerkiness of movement or change of focus in certain frame sequences. Kennedy's body In his 1981 book Best Evidence, author David Lifton presented the thesis that President Kennedy's dead body had been altered between the Dallas Hospital and the autopsy site at Bethesda for the purposes of creating erroneous conclusions about the number and direction of the shots. Fabrication of evidence Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Murder weapon The Warren Commission found that the shots that killed Kennedy and wounded Connolly were fired from an Italian 6.5 mm Mannlicher Carcano rifle owned by Oswald. Deputy Sheriff Eugene Boone and Deputy Constable Seymour Weitzman both initially identified the rifle found in the Texas School Book Depository as a 7.65 Mauser. Weitzman signed an affidavit the following day describing the weapon as a 7.65 Mauser bolt action equipped with a 4/18 scope, a thick leather brownish black sling on it. Deputy Sheriff Roger Craig claimed that he saw 7.65 Mauser bullets stamped on the barrel of the weapon. But when interviewed in 1968 by Barry Ernest, author of The Girl on the Stairs the search for a missing witness to the JFK assassination, Craig said, I felt then and I still feel now that the weapon was a 7.65 German Mauser. I was there. I saw it when it was first pulled from its hiding place, and I am not alone in describing it as a Mauser." So, in the videotaped interview he said he read Mauser on the rifle, and to Ernest he said that he felt it was a Mauser. Dallas District Attorney Henry Wade told the press that the weapon found in the book depository was a 7.65 Mauser, and the media reported this. But investigators later identified the rifle as a 6.5 mm Carcano. In Matrix for Assassination, author Richard Gilbride suggested that both weapons were involved in the assassination and that Dallas Police Captain Will Fritz and Lieutenant J. Carl Day both might have been conspirators, addressing speculation and rumors. The Warren Commission identified Weitzman as the original source of the speculation that the rifle was a Mauser", and stated that police laboratory technicians subsequently arrived and correctly identified the murder weapon as a 6.5 Italian rifle. <laughs> <laughs> Bullets and cartridges The Warren Commission determined that three bullets were fired at the presidential motorcade. One of the three bullets missed the vehicle entirely, another bullet hit President Kennedy and passed through his body before striking Governor Connolly, and the third bullet was the fatal head shot to the president. 
Some claim that the bullet that passed through President Kennedy's body and hit Governor Connolly dubbed by critics of the commission as the magic bullet was missing too little mass to account for the total weight of bullet fragments later found by the doctors who operated on Connolly at Parkland Hospital. Those making this claim included the governor's chief surgeon, Dr. Robert Shaw, as well as two of Kennedy's autopsy surgeons, Commander James Humes and Lieutenant Colonel Pierre Fink. However, in his book Six Seconds in Dallas, author Josiah Thompson took issue with this claim. Thompson added up the weight of the bullet fragments listed in the doctor reports and concluded that their total weight could have been less than the mass missing from the bullet. With Connolly's death in 1993, forensic pathologist Dr. Cyril Wecht and the Assassination Archives and Research Center petitioned Attorney General Janet Reno to recover the remaining bullet fragments from Connolly's body, contending that the fragments would disprove the Warren Commission's single bullet, single gunman conclusion. The Justice Department replied that it would have had no legal authority to recover the fragments unless Connolly's family gave it permission to do so. Connolly's family refused permission. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Allegations of multiple gunmen. The Warren Commission concluded that Three shots were fired from the Texas School Book Depository in a time period ranging from approximately 4.8 to in excess of 7 seconds." Some assassination researchers, including Anthony Summers, dispute the Commission's findings. They point to evidence that brings into question the number of shots fired, the origin of the shots, and Oswald's ability to accurately fire three shots in such a short amount of time. These researchers suggest that multiple gunmen were involved. <laughs> number of shots Based on the consensus among the witnesses at the scene", and, in particular the three spent cartridges. The Warren Commission determined that, "...the preponderance of the evidence indicated that three shots were fired." In 1979, the House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded that there were four shots, one coming from the Grassy Knoll, the Warren Commission, and later the House Select Committee on Assassinations, concluded that one of the shots hit President Kennedy in the back of his neck, exited his throat, and struck Governor Connolly in the back, exited the governor's chest, shattered his right wrist, and implanted itself in his left thigh. This conclusion became known as the single bullet theory. Mary Mormon said in a TV interview that immediately after the assassination, there were either three or four shots close together, that shots were still being fired after the fatal head shot, and that she was in the line of fire. In 1967, Josiah Thompson concluded from a close study of the Zapruder film and other forensic evidence, corroborated by the eyewitnesses, that four shots were fired in Dealey Plaza, with one wounding Connolly and three hitting Kennedy. On the day of the assassination, Nellie Connolly was seated in the presidential car next to Governor Connolly, who was her husband. In her book From Love Field, Our Final Hours, she said she believed that her husband was hit by a bullet separate from the two that hit Kennedy. <inaudible> <inaudible> Origin of the shots The Warren Commission concluded that all of the shots fired at President Kennedy came from the sixth floor window at the southeast corner of the Texas School Book Depository. The Commission based its conclusion on the cumulative evidence of eyewitnesses, firearms, and ballistic experts and medical authorities. 
including on-site testing, as well as analysis of films and photographs conducted by the FBI and the U.S. Secret Service. In 1979, the House Select Committee on Assassinations agreed to publish a report from Warren Commission critic Robert Grodin, in which he named nearly two dozen suspected firing points in Dealey Plaza. These sites included multiple locations in or on the roof of the Texas School Book Depository, the Dahl Tex Building, the Dallas County Records Building, the Triple Overpass, a storm drain located along the north curb of Elm Street, and the Grassy Knoll. Josiah Thompson concluded that the shots fired at the motorcade came from three locations, the Texas School Book Depository, the Grassy Knoll, and the Dahl Tex Building. Topic. Testimony of eyewitnesses According to some assassination researchers, the Grassy Knoll was identified by most witnesses as the area from where shots were fired. In March 1965, Harold Feldman wrote that there were 121 witnesses to the assassination listed in the Warren Report, 51 of whom indicated that the shots that killed Kennedy came from the Grassy Knoll, while 32 said the shots originated from the Texas School Book Depository. In 1967, Josiah Thompson examined the statements of 64 witnesses and concluded that 33 of them thought that the shots emanated from the Grassy Knoll. In 1966, Esquire magazine credited Feldman with advancing the theory that there were two assassins, one on the Grassy Knoll and one in the book depository. Jim Mars also wrote that the weight of evidence suggested shots came from both the Grassy Knoll and the Texas School Book Depository. Lee Bowers operated a railroad tower that overlooked the parking lot on the north side of the Grassy Knoll. He reported that he saw two men behind the Grassy Knoll stockyard fence before the shooting took place. The men did not appear to be acting together or doing anything suspicious. After the shooting, Bowers said that one of the men remained behind the fence and lost track of the second man whose clothing blended into the foliage. When interviewed by Mark Lane, Bowers noted that he saw something that attracted his attention, either a flash of light or smoke from the knoll, allowing him to believe, "...something out of the ordinary," had occurred there. Bowers told Lane that he heard three shots, the last two in quick succession. He stated that there was no way they could have been fired from the same exact rifle. Bowers later purportedly said to his supervisor, Olan Degas, that he saw a man in the parking lot throw what looked like a rifle into one the cars. However, in that same 1966 interview, Bowers clarified that the two men he saw were standing in the opening between the pergola and the fence, and that, no one was behind the fence once the shots were fired. Jesse Price was the building engineer for the Terminal Annex Building, which is located across from the Texas School Book Depository on the opposite side of Dealey Plaza. He viewed the presidential motorcade from the Terminal Annex Building's roof. In an interview with Mark Lane, Price said that he believed the shots came from just behind the picket fence where it joins the triple underpass. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Physical evidence. Several conspiracy theories posit that at least one shooter was located in the Dahl Tex building, located across the street from the Texas School Book Depository. According to L. Fletcher Prouty, the physical location of James Togg when he was injured by a bullet fragment is not consistent with the trajectory of a missed shot from the Texas School Book Depository, leading Prouty to theorize that Togg was instead wounded by a missed shot from the second floor of the Dahl Tex building. Some assassination researchers claim that FBI photographs of the presidential limousine show a bullet hole in its windshield above the rear view mirror and a crack in the windshield itself. 
When Robert Grodin, author of The Killing of a President, asked for an explanation, the FBI responded that what Grodin thought was a bullet hole occurred prior to Dallas. In 1993, George Whitaker, a manager at the Ford Motor Company's Rouge plant in Detroit, told attorney and criminal justice professor Doug Weldon that after reporting to work on November 25, 1963, he discovered the presidential limousine in the Rouge plant's B building with its windshield removed. Whitaker said that the limousine's removed windshield had a through and through bullet hole from the front. He said that he was directed by one of Ford's vice presidents to use the windshield as a template to fabricate a new windshield for installation in the limousine. Whitaker also said he was told to destroy the old one. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Film and photographic evidence. Film and photographic evidence of the assassination have led viewers to different conclusions regarding the origin of the shots. When the fatal shot was fired, the president's head and upper torso moved backwards—indicating, to many observers, a shot from the right front. Sherry Gutierrez, a certified crime scene and bloodstain pattern analyst, concluded that the fatal head injury to President Kennedy was the result of a single gunshot fired from the right front of the president. Paul Chambers believes that the fatal head shot is consistent with a high velocity, approximately 1,200 meters per second, 4,000 feet sec rifle, rather than the medium velocity, 600 meters per second, 2,000 feet sec Manlikar Carcano. Although it has been thought that Zapruder film frames 312 and 313 show Kennedy's head moving forward before moving backwards, that close inspection of the frames show Kennedy's head actually pivoted both forward and downwards. Anthony Marsh claims that it was the deceleration of the car by driver William Greer that allowed the president's head to move in that direction. Some, including Josiah Thompson, Robert Grodin, and Cyril Wecht, state that the film shows that his head was hit by two near-simultaneous bullets, one from the rear and the other from the right front. Topic acoustical evidence According to the House Select Committee on Assassinations, a Dictabelt recording of the Dallas Police Department radio dispatch transmissions from the day of the assassination was analyzed to resolve questions concerning the number, timing, and origin of the shots fired in Dealey Plaza. They concluded that the source of the recording was from an open microphone on the motorcycle of H. B. McLean escorting the motorcade and that the scientific acoustical evidence established a high probability that two gunmen fired at President John F. Kennedy. The acoustical analysis firm hired by the committee recommended that they conduct an acoustical reconstruction of the assassination in Dealey Plaza so they could determine if any of the six impulse patterns on the dispatch tape were fired either from the Texas School Book Depository or from the Grassy Knoll. The reconstruction entailed firing from two locations in Dealey Plaza, the Depository and the Knoll, at particular target locations and recording the sounds through various microphones. The purpose for this was to determine if the sequences of impulses recorded during the reconstruction would match any of those within the dispatch tape. If they showed a positive result, then it would be possible to figure out if the impulse patterns on the dispatch tape were caused by shots fired from the depository and the knoll. In 1978, at the behest of the House Select Committee on Assassinations, members of the Dallas Police Pistol Team participated in an acoustical reconstruction in which they would fire rifles and pistols from any of the locations selected by the researchers. During this reconstruction, the Dallas police marksmen had no difficulty in hitting the targets. 
The committee's firearms experts, testified that given the distance and angle from the sixth floor window to the location of the President's limousine, it would have been easier to use the open iron sights. The Warren Commission tests were carried out on assuming that Oswald, whom they and the committee concluded fired the shots, had used the telescopic sight. An article in Science and Justice, a quarterly publication of Britain's Forensic Science Society, found there was a 96% percent certainty, based on analysis of audio recordings made during the assassination, that a shot was fired from the grassy knoll in front of and to the right of the president's limousine. The acoustical evidence has since been discredited. Officer H. B. McLean, from whose motorcycle radio the HSCA acoustic experts said the Dictabelt evidence came, has repeatedly stated that he was not yet in Dealey Plaza once the assassination occurred. McLean asked the committee, if it was my radio on my motorcycle, why did it not record the revving up at high speed plus my siren when we immediately took off for Parkland Hospital? In 1982, a panel of 12 scientists appointed by the National Academy of Sciences, including Nobel laureates Norman Ramsey and Luis Alvarez, unanimously concluded that the acoustic evidence submitted to the HSCA was seriously flawed, was recorded reported after the president was shot, and did not indicate any additional gunshots. Their conclusions were later published in the journal Science, in a 2001 article in Science and Justice, D.B. Thomas wrote that the NAS investigation was itself flawed. He concluded that with a 96.3% certainty, there were at least two gunmen firing at President Kennedy and that at least one shot came from the grassy knoll. In 2005, Thomas's conclusions were rebutted in the same journal. Ralph Linsker and several members of the original NAS team reanalyzed the timings of the recordings and reaffirmed the earlier conclusion of the NAS report that the alleged shot sounds were recorded approximately one minute after the assassination. In a 2010 book, D.B. Thomas challenged the 2005 Science and Justice article and restated his conclusion that there actually were two gunmen. Medical evidence Some researchers have pointed to the large number of doctors and nurses at Parkland Hospital who reported that a major portion of the back of the president's head may have been blown out, which strongly suggests that he was hit from the front. Some critics skeptical of the official, single bullet theory have stated that the bullet's trajectory, which hit Kennedy above the right shoulder blade and passed through his neck according to the autopsy, would have had to change course to pass through Connolly's rib cage and fracture his wrist. Kennedy's death certificate, which was signed by his personal physician Dr. George Berkeley, locates the bullet at about the level of the third thoracic vertebra, which some claim was not high enough to exit his throat. Furthermore, since the shooter was in a sixth-floor window of the book depository building, the bullet traveled downward. The autopsy descriptive sheet displays a diagram of the president's body with the same low placement at the third thoracic vertebra. The holes in the back of his shirt and jacket are also claimed to support a wound too low to be consistent with the single bullet theory. There is a conflicting testimony regarding the autopsy performed on Kennedy's body, particularly during the examination on his brain and whether or not the photos submitted as evidence are the same as those taken during the examination. Douglas Horn, the Assassination Record Review Board's chief analyst for military records, said he was 90-95% certain that the photographs in the National Archives are not really of Kennedy's brain. Supporting Horn was Dr. Gary Aguilar, who stated, According to Horn's findings, the second brain, which showed an exit wound in the front, allegedly replaced Kennedy's real brain, which revealed much greater damage to the rear, consistent with an exit wound and thus evidence of a shot from the front. 
Paul O'Connor, a laboratory technologist who assisted in the president's autopsy, claimed that the autopsy at Bethesda Naval Hospital was conducted in obedience to a high command and that nearly all the brain matter in Kennedy's skull was already missing before the autopsy at Bethesda Hospital. In his book JFK and the Unspeakable, James Douglas cites autopsy doctor Pierre Fink's testimony at the trial of Clay Shaw as evidence that Fink was a reluctant witness to the military control over the doctor's examination of the president's body." A bone fragment found in Dealey Plaza by William Allen Harper the day following the assassination was reported by the HSCA's Forensic Pathology Panel to have been part of Kennedy's parietal bone. Some critics of the lone gunman theory, including James Douglas, David Lifton, and David Mantic, state that the fragment is actually a piece of occipital bone ejected from an exit wound in the back of Kennedy's head. They stated this finding is evidence of a cover-up as it proves that the skull radiographs obtained during the autopsy which do not show significant bone loss in the occipital area, are not authentic. Topic. Oswald's marksmanship The Warren Commission examined the capabilities of the Carcano rifle and ammunition, as well as Oswald's military training and post-military experience, and determined that Oswald had the ability to fire three shots within a time span of 4.8 to 5.6 seconds. According to their report, an Army specialist using Oswald's rifle was able to duplicate the feat and even improved on the time. The report also states that the Army Infantry Weapons Evaluation Branch Test fired Oswald's rifle 47 times and found that it was quite accurate, comparing it to the accuracy of an M14 rifle. Also contained in the Commission report is testimony by Marine Corps Major Eugene Anderson confirming that Oswald's military records show that he qualified as sharpshooter in 1956. According to official Marine Corps records, Oswald was tested in shooting in December 1956, scoring 212, slightly above the minimum for qualification as a sharpshooter the intermediate category, but in May 1959, he scored 191 earning the lower designation of marksman. The highest marksmanship category in the Marine Corps is expert 220. Despite Oswald's confirmed marksmanship in the USMC, conspiracy theorists like Walt Brown and authors such as Richard H. Popkin contend that Oswald was a notoriously poor shot, that his rifle was inaccurate, and that no reconstruction of the event has ever been able to duplicate his ability to fire three shots within the time frame given by the Warren Commission. Topic. Role of Oswald The Warren Commission and other federal investigations ruled that Oswald either acted alone or conspired with others in the assassination, citing his actions in the years leading up to the event. Evidence of Oswald's pro-communist and radical tendencies include his defection to Russia, the New Orleans branch of the Fair Play for Cuba committee he had organized, and also various public and private statements made by him espousing Marxism and other leftist ideologies. Others have argued that his behavior was in fact a carefully planned ruse as part of an effort by U.S. intelligence agencies to infiltrate subversive groups and conduct counter-intelligence operations in communist countries, and that his role in the assassination was that of either an agent or an informant of the government trying to expose the plot behind the assassination. Oswald himself claimed to be innocent, denying all charges and even declaring to reporters that he was just a patsy. 
He also insisted that the photos of him holding a rifle had been faked, an assertion contradicted by statements made by his wife, Marina, and the analysis of photographic experts such as Lyndall L. Shanifelt of the FBI. Oswald's role as FBI informant was investigated by Lee Rankin and others of the Warren Commission, but their findings were inconclusive. Several FBI employees had made statements indicating that Oswald was indeed a paid informant, but the commission was nonetheless unable to verify the veracity of those claims. FBI agent James P. Hostie reported that his office's interactions with Oswald were limited to dealing with his complaints about being harassed by the Bureau for being a communist sympathizer. In the weeks before the assassination, Oswald made a personal visit to the FBI's Dallas branch office with a hand-delivered letter which purportedly contained a threat of some sort but, controversially, Hostie destroyed the letter by order of J. Gordon Shanklin, his supervisor. Some researchers suggest that Oswald served as an active agent of the Central Intelligence Agency, often pointing to how he attempted to defect to Russia but was, however, able to return without difficulty even receiving a repatriation loan from the State Department as evidence of such. A former roommate of Oswald, James Botello, who would later become a California judge stated in an interview with Mark Lane that he believed Oswald was involved in an intelligence assignment in Russia, although Botello did not mention any of those suspicions in his testimony to the Warren Commission years earlier. Oswald's mother, Marguerite, often insisted that her son was recruited by an agency of the U.S. government and sent to Russia. New Orleans district attorney and later judge, Jim Garrison, who in 1967 brought Clay Shaw to trial for the assassination of President Kennedy also held the opinion that Oswald was most likely a CIA agent drawn into the plot to be used as a scapegoat, even going as far as to say that Oswald, "...genuinely was probably a hero." Senator Richard Schweiker, a member of the U.S. Senate Select Committee on Intelligence remarked that, "...everywhere you look with Oswald, there are fingerprints of intelligence." Richard Sprague, interim staff director and chief counsel to the U.S. House Select Committee on Assassinations, stated that if he "...had to do it over again," He would have investigated the Kennedy assassination by probing Oswald's ties to the Central Intelligence Agency. In 1978, former CIA paymaster and accountant James Wilcott testified before the HSCA, stating that Lee Harvey Oswald was a «known agent» of the Central Intelligence Agency. Wilcott and his wife, Elsie also a former employee of the CIA later repeated those claims in a story by the San Francisco Chronicle. Despite its official policy of neither confirming nor denying the status of agents, both the CIA itself and many officers working in the region at the time including David Attlee Phillips have unofficially dismissed the plausibility of any possible ties to Oswald and the agency. Robert Blakey, staff director and chief counsel for the U.S. House Select Committee on Assassinations, supported that assessment in his conclusions as well. <laughs> <laughs> Alternative gunmen In addition to Oswald, Jerome Croth has named 26 people as possible assassins in Dealey Plaza. They include Orlando Bosch, James Files, Desmond Fitzgerald, Charles Harrelson, Jerry Hemming, Chauncey Holt, Howard Hunt, Charles Nicoletti, Charles Rogers, Johnny Roselli, Lucian Sarti, and Frank Sturgis. Topic. Three tramps Vincent Bugliosi provides a «partial list of assassins whom one or more conspiracy theorists have actually named and identified as having fired a weapon at Kennedy» in his book Reclaiming History. 
He also mentions the three tramps, men photographed by several Dallas area newspapers under police escort near the Texas School Book Depository shortly after the assassination. Since the mid 1960s, various allegations have been made about the identities of the men and their involvement in a conspiracy to kill Kennedy. Records released by the Dallas Police Department in 1989 identified the men as Gus Abrams, Harold Doyle, and John Jedney. <laughs> Allegations of other conspirators E. Howard Hunt The theory that former CIA agent and Watergate burglar E. Howard Hunt was a participant in the assassination of Kennedy garnered much publicity from 1978 to 2000. In 1981, he won a libel judgment against Liberty Lobby's paper The Spotlight, which in 1978 printed an allegation by Victor Marchetti suggesting Hunt's involvement in a conspiracy. The libel award was thrown out on appeal and the newspaper was successfully defended by Mark Lane in a second trial. Former KGB archivist Vasily Mitrokhin indicated in 1999 that Hunt was made part of a fabricated conspiracy theory disseminated by a Soviet active measures program designed to discredit the CIA and the United States. After his death in 2007, an audio taped deathbed confession in which Hunt claimed first-hand knowledge of a conspiracy, as a co-conspirator, was released by his son St. John Hunt. In the confession, Hunt claimed to have been a «bench warmer» in Dallas during the events, and he named several high-level CIA operatives as those who likely carried out the logistics of the assassination. Hunt named Vice President Lyndon Johnson as the most likely figure behind the main impetus of the conspiracy. The authenticity of the confession was met with some skepticism. <laughs> J.D. Tippett Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett has been named in some conspiracy theories as a renegade CIA operative sent to silence Oswald and as the «badge man» assassin on the grassy knoll. According to some Warren Commission critics, Oswald was set up to be killed by Tippett, but Tippett was killed by Oswald before he could carry out his assignment. Other critics doubt that Tippett was killed by Oswald and assert he was shot by other conspirators. See section below. Some critics have alleged that Tippett was associated with organized crime or right-wing politics. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Bernard Weissman According to the Warren Commission, the publication of a full-page, paid advertisement critical of Kennedy in the November 22, 1963, Dallas Morning News, which was signed by the American Fact-Finding Committee, and noted Bernard Weissman as its chairman, was investigated to determine whether any members of the group claiming responsibility for it were connected to Oswald or to the assassination. The commission stated that, "...the American Fact-Finding Committee," was a fictitious sponsoring organization and that there was no evidence linking the four men responsible for the genesis of the ad with either Oswald or Ruby, or to a conspiracy to assassinate Kennedy. Related to the advertisement, Mark Lane testified during the Warren Commission's hearings that an informant whom he refused to name told him that Weissman had met with Tippett and Ruby eight days before the assassination at Ruby's Carousel Club. The commission reported that they "...found no evidence that such a meeting took place anywhere at any time," and that there was no "...credible evidence that any of the three men knew each other." Lane later stated that he initially learned of the meeting through reporter Thayer Waldo of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. According to Lane, a "...prominent Dallas figure." 
who frequented Ruby's Carousel Club told Waldo, and later Lane, that he observed the meeting of the three men at the club. He said, I had promised the man he would not be involved, he was a leading Dallas citizen, he was married, and the stripper he was going with had become pregnant. Despite not having revealed to the Warren Commission that Waldo was his original source of the alleged meeting, Lane disputed their findings and complained that they failed to ask Waldo about it. According to Hugh Ainsworth, the source of the allegation whose identity Lane promised not to reveal was Carol Jarnagin, a Dallas attorney who had also claimed to have overheard a meeting between Oswald and Ruby. Ainsworth wrote, several people in Dallas were well aware of Jarnagin's tale, and that he later admitted making it all up. <laughs> Unnamed accomplices in the murder of J.D. Tippett The Warren Commission concluded that Oswald killed Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett in an apparent attempt to escape. The evidence that formed the basis for this conclusion was, one, two eyewitnesses who heard the shots and saw the shooting of Dallas police patrolman J.D. Tippett and seven eyewitnesses who saw the flight of the gunman with revolver in hand positively identified Lee Harvey Oswald as the man they saw fire the shots or flee from the scene. Two, the cartridge cases found near the scene of the shooting were fired from the revolver in the possession of Oswald at the time of his arrest to the exclusion of all other weapons. Three, the revolver in Oswald's possession at the time of his arrest was purchased by and belonged to Oswald, and four, Oswald's jacket was found along the path of flight taken by the gunman as he fled from the scene of the killing. Some researchers have alleged that the murder of Officer Tippett was part of a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. Jim Mars hypothesized that, "...the slaying of Officer J.D. Tippett may have played some part in a scheme to have Oswald killed, perhaps to eliminate co-conspirator Tippett or simply to anger Dallas police and cause itchy trigger fingers." Researcher James Douglas said that, the killing of Tippett helped motivate the Dallas police to kill an armed Oswald in the Texas theater, which would have disposed of the scapegoat before he could protest his being framed." Harold Weisberg offered a simpler explanation. Immediately, the flimsy police case against Oswald required a willingness to believe. This was proved by affixing to Oswald the opprobrious epithet of cop killer. Jim Garrison alleged that evidence was altered to frame Oswald, stating, If Oswald was innocent of the Tippett murder, the foundation of the government's case against him collapsed. Some critics doubt that Tippett was killed by Oswald and assert he was shot by other conspirators. They allege discrepancies in witness testimony and physical evidence that they think call into question the Commission's conclusions regarding the murder of Tippett. According to Jim Mars, Oswald's guilt in the assassination of Kennedy is placed in question by the presence of a growing body of evidence to suggest that he did not kill Tippett. Others say that multiple men were directly involved in Tippett's killing. Conspiracy researcher Ken Thomas has alleged that the Warren Commission omitted testimony and evidence that two men shot Tippett and that one left the scene in a car. William Alexander the Dallas assistant district attorney who recommended that Oswald be charged with the Kennedy and Tippett murders later became skeptical of the Warren Commission's version of the Tippett murder. He stated that the Commission's conclusions on Oswald's movements don't add up, and that, certainly, Oswald may have had accomplices. According to Brian McKenna's review of Henry Hurt's book, Reasonable Doubt, Hurt reported that, Tippett may have been killed because he impregnated the wife of another man, and that Dallas police officers lied and altered evidence to set up Oswald to save Tippett's reputation.
Topic: <laughs> Allegations regarding witness testimony and physical evidence. The Warren Commission identified Helen Markham and Domingo Benavides as two witnesses who actually saw the shooting. Conspiracy theorist Richard Belzer criticized the commission for, in his description, relying on the testimony of Markham whom he described as imaginative. Jim Mars also took issue with Markham's testimony, stating that her credibility was strained to the breaking point. Joseph Ball, senior counsel to the commission, referred to Markham's testimony as full of mistakes, characterizing her as an utter screwball. The Warren Commission addressed concerns regarding Markham's reliability as a witness and concluded, however, even in the absence of Mrs. Markham's testimony, there is ample evidence to identify Oswald as the killer of Tippett. Domingo Benavides initially said that he did not think he could identify Tippett's assailant and was never asked to view a police lineup, even though he was the person closest to the killing. Benavides later testified that the killer resembled pictures he had seen of Oswald. Other witnesses were taken to police lineups. However, critics have questioned these lineups as they consisted of people who looked very different from Oswald. Additionally, witnesses who did not appear before the commission identified an assailant who was not Oswald. Aquila Clemens said she saw two men near Tippett's car just before the shooting. She said that after the shooting, she ran outside of her house and saw a man with a gun whom she described as kind of heavy. She said he waved to the second man, urging him to go on. Frank Wright said he emerged from his home and observed the scene seconds after the shooting. He described a man standing by Tippett's body who had on a long coat and said the man ran to a parked car and drove away. Critics have questioned whether the cartridge cases recovered from the scene were the same as those that were subsequently entered into evidence. Two of the cases were recovered by witness Domingo Benavides and turned over to police officer J. M. Poe. Poe told the FBI that he marked the shells with his own initials, J. M. P., to identify them. Sergeant Gerald Hill later testified to the Warren Commission that it was he who had ordered police officer Poe to mark the shells. However, Poe's initials were not found on the shells produced by the FBI six months later. Testifying before the Warren Commission, Poe said that although he recalled marking the cases, he couldn't swear to it. The identification of the cases at the crime scene raises more questions. Sergeant Gerald Hill examined one of the shells and radioed the police dispatcher, saying, the shell at the scene indicates that the suspect is armed with an automatic .38 rather than a pistol." However, Oswald was reportedly arrested carrying a non-automatic .38 special revolver. <laughs> Allegations regarding timeline the Warren Commission investigated Oswald's movements between the time of the assassination and the shooting of Tippett, to ascertain whether Oswald might have had an accomplice who helped him flee the book depository. The Commission concluded, Through the testimony of seven witnesses, that Oswald was always alone. According to their final report, Oswald was seen by his housekeeper leaving his rooming house shortly after 1 p.m. and had enough time to travel nine-tenths of a mile kilometers to the scene where Tippett was killed at 1.16 p.m. Some Warren Commission critics believe that Oswald did not have enough time to get from his house to the scene where Tippett was killed. The Commission's own test and estimation of Oswald's walking speed demonstrated that one of the longer routes to the Tippett shooting scene took 17 minutes and 45 seconds to walk. 
No witness ever surfaced who saw Oswald walk from his rooming house to the murder scene. Conspiracy researcher Robert Grodin believes that Tippett's murder may have occurred earlier than the time given in the Warren Report. He notes that the commission established the time of the shooting as 1.16 p.m. from police tapes that logged Domingo Benavides's use of the radio in Tippett's car. However, Benavides testified that he did not approach the car until a few minutes after the shooting, because he was afraid that the gunman might return. He was assisted in using the radio by witness T.F. Boley who testified to Dallas police that at the time he arrived to help, several people were at the scene, and that the time was 1.10 p.m. Witness Helen Markham stated in her affidavit to the Dallas Sheriff's Department that Tippett was killed at, approximately 1.06 p.m. She later affirmed the time in testimony before the Warren Commission, saying, I wouldn't be afraid to bet it wasn't six or seven minutes after one." She initially told the FBI that the shooting occurred, "...possibly around 1.30 p.m." In an unpublished manuscript titled When They Kill a President, Deputy Sheriff Roger Craig stated that when he heard the news that Tippett had been shot, he noted that the time was 1.06 p.m. However, in a later statement to the press, Craig seemed confused about the time of the shooting. Warren Butch Burroughs, who ran the concession stand at the Texas Theater where Oswald was arrested, said that Oswald came into the theater between 1 o'clock and 1.07 p.m. He also claimed he sold Oswald popcorn at 1.15 p.m. The official time of Officer Tippett's murder. Julia Postal told the Warren Commission that Burroughs initially told her the same thing although he later denied this. A theater patron, Jack Davis, also corroborated Burroughs's time, claiming he observed Oswald in the theater prior to 1.20 p.m. <laughs> Unidentified witnesses Some conspiracy theories surrounding the Kennedy assassination have focused on witnesses to the assassination who have not been identified, or who have not identified themselves, despite the media attention that the Kennedy assassination has received. <laughs> Umbrella Man The so-called Umbrella Man was one of the closest bystanders to the president when he was first struck by a bullet. The ''Umbrella Man'' has become the subject of conspiracy theories after footage of the assassination showed him holding an open umbrella as the Kennedy motorcade passed, despite the fact that it was not raining at the time. One conspiracy theory, proposed by assassination researcher Robert Cutler, suggests that a dart with a paralyzing agent could have been fired from the umbrella, disabling Kennedy and making him a sitting duck for an assassination. In 1975, CIA weapons developer Charles Sensini told the Senate Intelligence Committee that such an umbrella weapon was in the hands of the CIA in 1963. A more prevalent conspiracy theory holds that the umbrella could have been used to provide visual signals to hidden gunmen. In 1978, Louis Stephen Witt came forward and identified himself as the Umbrella Man. Testifying before the United States House Select Committee on Assassinations, Witt stated he brought the umbrella to heckle Kennedy and protest the appeasement policies of the president's father, Joseph Kennedy. He added, I think if the Guinness Book of World Records had a category for people who were at the wrong place at the wrong time, doing the wrong thing, I would be number one in that position, without even a close runner-up. Some researchers have noted a number of inconsistencies with Witt's story, however, and do not believe him to be the true Umbrella Man. The Umbrella Man is the subject of a 2011 documentary short by Errol Morris, for The New York Times.
Topic: <laughs> Dark complected man. An unidentified individual who is referred to by some conspiracy theorists as the dark complected man can be seen in several photographs, taken seconds after the assassination, sitting on the sidewalk next to the umbrella man on the north side of Elm Street. Louis Stephen Witt, who identified himself as the umbrella man, said he was unable to identify the other individual, whose dark complexion has led some conspiracy theorists to speculate Cuban government involvement, or Cuban exile involvement, in the assassination of Kennedy. <laughs> Possible witnesses Some conspiracy theories focus on individuals that it is claimed can be seen in photographs of the assassination. Both Badge Man and Black Dog Man have been suggested as possible assassins of President Kennedy. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Badge Man. Badge Man and Tin Hat Man are figures on the grassy knoll who it is alleged can be seen in the Mary Mormon photo, taken approximately one sixth of a second after President Kennedy was struck with the fatal head wound. The figures were first discovered by researchers Jack White and Gary Mack and are discussed in a 1988 documentary called The Men Who Killed Kennedy, where it is alleged a third figure can also be seen on the grassy knoll, possibly the eyewitness Gordon Arnold. The badge man figure so called as he appears to be wearing a uniform similar to that worn by a policeman, with a badge prominent helped fuel conspiracy theories linking Dallas police officers, or someone impersonating a police officer, to the assassination. <laughs> Black Dog Man Another «figure» that has been the subject of conspiracy is the so-called «Black Dog Man» figure who can be seen at the corner of a retaining wall in the Willis and Betzner photo of the assassination. In an interview, Marilyn Sitzman told Josiah Thompson that she saw a young black couple who were eating lunch and drinking Cokes on a bench behind the retaining wall and, therefore, it is possible that the black dog man figure is actually the black woman and her child. If so, the woman has never come forward to identify herself. In The Killing of a President, Robert Grodin argues that the ''Black Dog Man'' figure can be seen in a Pyracantha bush in frame 413 of the Zapruder film. The United States House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded that a head of an individual could be seen but that this individual was situated in front of, rather than behind the bushes. Bill Miller argues that this individual is actually the eyewitness Emmett Hudson. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theorists consider four or five groups, alone or in combination, to be the primary suspects in the assassination of Kennedy, the CIA, the military-industrial complex, organized crime, the government of Cuba, and Cuban exiles. Other domestic individuals, groups, or organizations implicated in various conspiracy theories include Lyndon Johnson, George H. W. Bush, Sam Giancana, J. Edgar Hoover, Earl Warren, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the United States Secret Service, the John Birch Society, and far-right wealthy Texans. Some other alleged foreign conspirators include Fidel Castro, the KGB and Nikita Khrushchev, Aristotle Onassis, the government of South Vietnam, and international drug lords, including a French heroin syndicate. <laughs> New Orleans conspiracy 
Soon after the assassination of President Kennedy, Oswald's activities in New Orleans, Louisiana, during the spring and summer of 1963, came under scrutiny. Three days after the assassination, on November 25, 1963, New Orleans attorney Dean Andrews told the FBI that he received a telephone call from a man named Clay Bertrand, on the day of the assassination, asking him to defend Oswald. Andrews would later repeat this claim in testimony to the Warren Commission. Also, in late November 1963, an employee of New Orleans private investigator Guy Bannister named Jack Martin began making accusations that fellow Bannister employee David Ferry was involved in the JFK assassination. Martin told police that Ferry was supposed to have been the getaway pilot in the assassination. He said that Ferry had outlined plans to kill Kennedy and that Ferry might have taught Oswald how to use a rifle with a telescopic sight. Martin claimed that Ferry had known Oswald from their days in the New Orleans Civil Air Patrol, and that he had seen a photograph, at Ferry's home, of Oswald in a Civil Air Patrol group. Ferry denied any association with Oswald. It was later discovered that Ferry had attended civil air patrol meetings in New Orleans in the 1950s that were also attended by a teenage Lee Harvey Oswald. In 1993, the PBS television program Frontline obtained a photograph taken in 1955, eight years before the assassination, showing Oswald and Ferry at a Civil Air Patrol cookout with other CAP cadets. Whether Oswald's and Ferry's association in the Civil Air Patrol in 1955 is relevant to their later possible association in 1963 is a subject of debate. According to several witnesses, in 1963, both Ferry and Bannister were working for lawyer G. Ray Gill on behalf of Jill's client, New Orleans Mafia boss Carlos Marcello, in an attempt to block Marcello's deportation to Guatemala. On the afternoon of November 22, 1963, the day John F. Kennedy was assassinated and the day Marcello was acquitted in his deportation case, New Orleans private investigator Guy Bannister and his employee, Jack Martin, were drinking together at a local bar. On their return to Bannister's office, the two men got into a heated argument. According to Martin, Bannister said something to which Martin replied, What are you going to do? Kill me like you all did Kennedy. Bannister drew his .357 Magnum revolver and pistol whipped Martin several times. Martin, badly injured, went by ambulance to Charity Hospital. Earlier, in the spring of 1963, Oswald had written to the New York City headquarters of the Pro Castro Fair Play for Cuba Committee, proposing to rent a small office at my own expense for the purpose of forming a FPCC branch here in New Orleans. As the sole member of the New Orleans chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, Oswald ordered 1,000 leaflets with the heading, Hands Off Cuba, from a local printer. On August 16, 1963, Oswald passed out Fair Play for Cuba leaflets in front of the International Trade Mart in New Orleans. One of Oswald's leaflets had the address, 544 Camp Street hand stamped on it, apparently by Oswald himself. The address was in the Newman Building, which from October 1961 to February 1962 housed the Cuban Revolutionary Council, a militant anti-Castro group. Around the corner but located in the same building, with a different entrance, was the address 531 Lafayette Street. The address of Guy Bannister Associates, the private detective agency run by Guy Bannister. Bannister's office was involved in anti-Castro and private investigative activities in the New Orleans area. A CIA file indicated that in September 1960, the CIA had considered using Guy Bannister Associates for the collection of foreign intelligence, but ultimately decided against it. 
In the late 1970s, the House Select Committee on Assassinations HSCA investigated the possible relationship of Oswald to Bannister's office. While the committee was unable to interview Guy Bannister who died in 1964, the committee did interview his brother Ross Bannister. Ross told the committee that his brother had mentioned seeing Oswald hand out fair play for Cuba literature on one occasion. Ross theorized that Oswald had used the 544 Camp Street address on his literature to embarrass Guy. Guy Bannister's secretary, Delphine Roberts, would later tell author Anthony Summers that she saw Oswald at Bannister's office, and that he filled out one of Bannister's agent application forms. She said, Oswald came back a number of times. He seemed to be on familiar terms with Bannister and with the office. The House Select Committee on Assassinations investigated Roberts's claims and said that, "...because of contradictions in Roberts' statements to the committee and lack of independent corroboration of many of her statements, the reliability of her statements could not be determined." In 1966, New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison began an investigation into the assassination of President Kennedy. Garrison's investigation led him to conclude that a group of right-wing extremists, including David Ferry and Guy Bannister, were involved with elements of the Central Intelligence Agency CIA in a conspiracy to kill Kennedy. Garrison would later claim that the motive for the assassination was anger over Kennedy's attempts to obtain a peace settlement in both Cuba and Vietnam. Garrison also came to believe that New Orleans businessman Clay Shaw was part of the conspiracy and that Clay Shaw used the pseudonym, Clay Bertrand. Garrison further believed that Shaw, Bannister, and Ferry conspired to set up Oswald as a patsy in the JFK assassination. On March 1, 1967, Garrison arrested and charged Shaw with conspiring to assassinate President Kennedy. On January 29, 1969, Clay Shaw was brought to trial on these charges, and the jury found him not guilty. In 2003, Judith Vary Baker whose employment records show that she worked at the Reilly Coffee Company in New Orleans at the same time Oswald did appeared in an episode of the television documentary series, The Men Who Killed Kennedy. Baker claimed that in 1963 she was recruited by Dr. Knut Michelson to work with Dr. Alton Oxner and Dr. Mary Sherman on a clandestine CIA project to develop a biological weapon that could be used to assassinate Fidel Castro. According to Baker, she and Oswald were hired by Reilly in the spring of 1963 as a «cover» for the operation. Baker further claimed that she and Oswald began an affair, and that later Oswald told her about Merida, Mexico—a city where he suggested they might begin their lives over again. According to John McAdams, Baker presents a «classic case of pushing the limits of plausibility too far». Others on both sides of the research community have widely dismissed her claims. However, other researchers, including James Fetzer, have concluded that Baker's claims are credible. Topic: <inaudible> CIA conspiracy. Addressing speculation that Oswald was a CIA agent or had some relationship with the agency, the Warren Commission stated in 1964 that their investigation revealed no evidence that Oswald was ever employed by the CIA in any capacity." The House Select Committee on Assassinations reported similarly in 1979 that T here was no indication in Oswald's CIA file that he had ever had contact with the agency. 
and concluded that the CIA was not involved in the assassination of Kennedy. Gatan Fonzi, an investigator for the House Select Committee on Assassinations, wrote that investigators were pressured not to look into the relationship between Lee Harvey Oswald and the CIA. He stated that CIA agent David Attlee Phillips, using the pseudonym, Maurice Bishop, was involved with Oswald prior to the Kennedy assassination in connection with anti Castro Cuban groups. In 1995, former U.S. Army intelligence officer and National Security Agency executive assistant John M. Newman published evidence that both the CIA and FBI deliberately tampered with their files on Lee Harvey Oswald both before and after the assassination. Furthermore, he found that both agencies withheld information that might have alerted authorities in Dallas that Oswald posed a potential threat to the president. Subsequently, Newman expressed a belief that CIA Chief of Counterintelligence James Angleton was probably the key figure in the assassination. According to Newman, only Angleton had the access, the authority, and the diabolically ingenious mind to manage this sophisticated plot. However, Newman surmised that the cover operation was not under James Angleton, but under Alan Dulles, the former CIA director, and later Warren Commission member, who had been dismissed by Kennedy after the failed Bay of Pigs invasion. In 1977, the FBI released 40,000 files pertaining to the assassination of Kennedy, including an April 3, 1967 memorandum from Deputy Director Cartha Deloach to a Associate Director Clyde Tolson that was written less than a month after President Johnson learned from J. Edgar Hoover about CIA plots to kill Fidel Castro. The memorandum reads, "...Marvin Watson advisor to President Johnson called me late last night and stated that the President had told him, in an off moment, that he was now convinced that there was a plot in connection with the JFK assassination." Watson stated the president felt that the CIA had had something to do with plot. Later, Cartha Deloach testified to the church committee that he felt this to be sheer speculation. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Shadow government conspiracy. One conspiracy theory suggests that a secret or shadow government including wealthy industrialists and right-wing politicians ordered the assassination of Kennedy. Peter Dale Scott has indicated that Kennedy's death allowed for policy reversals desired by the secret government to escalate the United States' military involvement in Vietnam. Military-industrial complex In the farewell speech given by U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower before he left office on January 17, 1961, warned the nation about the power of the military establishment and the arms industry. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists, and will persist." Some conspiracy theorists have argued that Kennedy planned to end the involvement of the United States in Vietnam, and was therefore targeted by those who had an interest in sustained military conflict, including the Pentagon and defense contractors. Former Texas Senator Ralph Yarborough in 1991 stated, Had Kennedy lived, I think we would have had no Vietnam War, with all of its traumatic and divisive influences in America. I think we would have escaped that." According to author James W. Douglas, Kennedy was assassinated because he was turning away from the Cold War and seeking a negotiated peace with the Soviet Union. Douglas argued that this was not the kind of leadership the CIA, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the military-industrial complex wanted in the White House. 
Oliver Stone's film, JFK, explored the possibility that Kennedy was killed by a conspiracy involving the military-industrial complex. L. Fletcher Prouty, Chief of Special Operations for the Joint Chiefs of Staff under Kennedy, and the person who inspired the character, Mr. X, in Stone's film, wrote that Kennedy's assassination was actually a coup d'état. Topic: Secret Service Conspiracy. The House Select Committee on Assassinations reported that it investigated alleged Secret Service complicity in the assassination and concluded that the Secret Service was not involved. However, the HSCA declared that the Secret Service was deficient in the performance of its duties. Among its findings, the HSCA noted, 1 that President Kennedy had not received adequate protection in Dallas, 2 that the Secret Service possessed information that was not properly analyzed, investigated, or used by the Secret Service in connection with the President's trip to Dallas, and 3 that the Secret Service agents in the motorcade were inadequately prepared to protect the President from a sniper. The HSCA specifically noted, No actions were taken by the agent in the right front seat of the presidential limousine Roy Kellerman to cover the president with his body, although it would have been consistent with Secret Service procedure for him to have done so. The primary function of the agent was to remain at all times in close proximity to the president in the event of such emergencies. Some argue that the lack of Secret Service protection occurred because Kennedy himself had asked that the Secret Service make itself discreet during the Dallas visit. However, Vince Palomara, who interviewed several Secret Service agents assigned to the Kennedy detail, disputes this. Palomara reports that Secret Service driver Sam Kinney told him that requests, such as removing the bubble top from the limousine in Dallas, not having agents positioned beside the limousine's rear bumper, and reducing the number of Dallas police motorcycle outriders near the limousine's rear bumper were not made by Kennedy. In the Echo from Dealey Plaza, Abraham Bolden the first African American on the White House Secret Service detail claimed to have overheard agents say that they would not protect Kennedy from would-be assassins. Colin McLaren, a former Australian police detective sergeant, was inspired by Boner Menninger's mortal error, to approach the assassination of Kennedy as a cold case investigation, and treating Howard Donahue's expert testimony as that of just one witness of many. After more than four years of research, he published a book titled JFK, The Smoking Gun, which was accompanied by a documentary. As an investigator, McLaren focuses on the existing witness testimony, including testimony from people present at Kennedy's autopsy rather than on his own ballistics or similar tests. Rather than just dismiss the ballistics tests carried out for the Warren Commission as an expert, their testimony to the Commission, including their qualifications, is quoted and critiqued, and also any cross-examination. He quotes many more witnesses than Donahue or Menninger as having believed that shots were fired at ground level, and observes a pattern of concealment of evidence. His conclusion, like those of Reppert and of Menninger, is that Donahue is correct in both the broad theory and the details. Questions regarding the forthrightness of the Secret Service increased in the 1990s when the Assassination Records Review Board—which was created when Congress passed the JFK Records Act—requested access to Secret Service records. The review board was told by the Secret Service that in January 1995, in violation of the JFK Records Act, the Secret Service destroyed protective survey reports that covered JFK's trips from September 24 through November 8, 1963. <laughs> Cuban exiles The House Select Committee on Assassinations wrote, 
The committee believes, on the basis of the evidence available to it, that anti-Castro Cuban groups, as groups, were not involved in the assassination of President Kennedy, but that the available evidence does not preclude the possibility that individual members may have been involved. With the 1959 Cuban Revolution that brought Fidel Castro to power, many Cubans left Cuba to live in the United States. Many of these exiles hoped to overthrow Castro and return to Cuba. Their hopes were dashed with the failed Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961, and many blamed President Kennedy for the failure. The House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded that some militant Cuban exiles might have participated in Kennedy's murder. These exiles worked closely with CIA operatives in violent activities against Castro's Cuba. In 1979, the committee reported. President Kennedy's popularity among the Cuban exiles had plunged deeply by 1963. Their bitterness is illustrated in a tape recording of a meeting of anti-Castro Cubans and right-wing Americans in the Dallas suburb of Farmer's Branch on October 1, 1963. Author Joan Didion explored the Miami anti-Castro Cuban theory in her 1987 book Miami. She discussed Marita Lorenz's testimony regarding Guillermo Novo, a Cuban exile who was involved in shooting a bazooka at the UN building from the East River during a speech by Che Guevara. Allegedly, Novo was affiliated with Lee Harvey Oswald and Frank Sturgis and carried weapons with them to a hotel in Dallas just prior to the assassination. These claims, though put forth to the House Assassinations Committee by Lorenz, have never been substantiated. Don DeLillo dramatized the Cuban theory in his 1988 novel Libra. <laughs> <laughs> organized crime conspiracy The House Select Committee on Assassinations wrote, the committee believes, on the basis of the evidence available to it, that the National Syndicate of Organized Crime, as a group, was not involved in the assassination of President Kennedy, but that the available evidence does not preclude the possibility that individual members may have been involved. Robert Blakey, who was chief counsel for the House Select Committee on Assassinations, would later conclude in his book, The Plot to Kill the President, that New Orleans Mafia boss Carlos Marcelo was likely part of a mafia conspiracy behind the assassination, and that the mafia had the means and the opportunity required to carry it out. Government documents have revealed that some members of the mafia worked with the Central Intelligence Agency on assassination attempts against. Cuban leader Fidel Castro. In the summer of 1960, the CIA recruited ex-FBI agent Robert Mahew to approach the West Coast representative of the Chicago mob, Johnny Roselli. When Mahew contacted Roselli, Mahew hid the fact that he was sent by the CIA, instead portraying himself as an advocate for international corporations. He offered to pay $150,000 to have Castro killed, but Roselli declined any pay. Roselli introduced Mahew to two men he referred to as Sam Gold and Joe. Sam Gold was Sam Giancana. Joe was Santo Traficante Jr., the Tampa, Florida, boss and one of the most powerful mobsters in pre-revolution Cuba. Glenn Kessler of The Washington Post explained, "...after Fidel Castro led a revolution that toppled a friendly government in 1959, the CIA was desperate to eliminate him. So the agency sought out a partner equally worried about Castro—the Mafia, which had lucrative investments in Cuban casinos." In his memoir, Bound by Honor, Bill Bonanno, son of New York Mafia boss Joseph Bonanno, disclosed that several Mafia families had long-standing ties with the anti-Castro Cubans through the Havana casinos operated by the Mafia before the Cuban Revolution. 
Many Cuban exiles and mafia bosses disliked President Kennedy, blaming him for the failed Bay of Pigs invasion. They also disliked his brother, then Attorney General Robert Kennedy, who had conducted an unprecedented legal assault on organized crime. This was especially provocative because several mafia families had allegedly worked with JFK's father, Joseph Kennedy, to get JFK elected. Both the mafia and the anti Castro Cubans were experts in assassination the Cubans having been trained by the CIA. Bonanno reported that he recognized the high degree of involvement of other Mafia families when Jack Ruby killed Oswald, since Bonanno was aware that Ruby was an associate of Chicago mobster Sam Giancana. Some conspiracy researchers have alleged a plot involving elements of the Mafia, the CIA, and the anti-Castro Cubans, including Anthony Summers, who stated, Sometimes people sort of glaze over about the notion that the Mafia and U.S. intelligence and the anti-Castro activists were involved together in the assassination of President Kennedy. In fact, there's no contradiction there. Those three groups were all in bed together at the time and had been for several years in the fight to topple Fidel Castro. News reporter Ruben Castaneda wrote in 2012, "...based on the evidence, it is likely that JFK was killed by a coalition of anti-Castro Cubans, the mob, and elements of the CIA." In his book, They Killed Our President, former Minnesota Governor Jesse Ventura concluded, John F. Kennedy was murdered by a conspiracy involving disgruntled CIA agents, anti-Castro Cubans, and members of the Mafia, all of whom were extremely angry at what they viewed as Kennedy's appeasement policies toward communist Cuba and the Soviet Union. Carlos Marcelo allegedly threatened to assassinate the president to short-circuit his younger brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, who was leading the administration's anti-Mafia crusade. Information released in 2006 by the FBI has led some to conclude that Carlos Marcelo confessed to his cellmate in Texas, Jack Van Lanningham, an FBI informant, using a transistor radio that was bugged by the FBI, to having organized Kennedy's assassination, and that the FBI covered up this information that it had in its possession. In his book, Contract on America, David Scheim provided evidence that Mafia leaders Carlos Marcelo, Santo Traficante Jr., and Jimmy Hoffa ordered the assassination of President Kennedy. Scheim cited in particular a 25-fold increase in the number of out-of-state telephone calls from Jack Ruby to associates of these crime bosses in the months before the assassination, and to an attempted confession by Jack Ruby while in prison. David E. Kaiser has also suggested mob involvement in his book, The Road to Dallas. Investigative reporter Jack Anderson concluded that Fidel Castro worked with organized crime figures to arrange the JFK assassination. In his book Peace, War, and Politics, Anderson claimed that Mafia member Johnny Roselli gave him extensive details of the plot. Anderson said that although he was never able to independently confirm Rosselli's entire story, many of Rosselli's details checked out. Anderson said that Oswald may have played a role in the assassination, but that more than one gunman was involved. Johnny Roselli, as previously noted, had worked with the CIA on assassination attempts against Castro. The History Channel program The Men Who Killed Kennedy presented additional claims of organized crime involvement. Christian David was a Corsican Mafia member interviewed in prison. He said that he was offered the assassination contract on President Kennedy, but that he did not accept it. However, he said that he knew the men who did accept the contract. According to David, there were three shooters. He provided the name of one, Lucian Sarti. David said that since the other two shooters were still alive, it would break a code of conduct for him to identify them. 
When asked what the shooters were wearing, David noted their modus operandi was to dress in costumes such as official uniforms. Much of Christian David's testimony was confirmed by former Corsican member Michelle Nicole, who was part of the DIA Witness Protection Program. The book Ultimate Sacrifice, by Lamar Waldron and Tom Hartman, attempted to synthesize these theories with new evidence. The authors argued that government officials felt obliged to help the assassins cover up the truth because the assassination conspiracy had direct ties to American government plots to assassinate Castro. Outraged at Robert Kennedy's attack on organized crime, mob leaders had President Kennedy killed to remove Robert from power. A government investigation of the plot was thwarted, the authors allege, because it would have revealed embarrassing evidence of American government involvement with organized crime in plots to kill Castro. Topic Lyndon B. Johnson Conspiracy A 2003 Gallup poll indicated that nearly 20% of Americans suspected Lyndon B. Johnson of being involved in the assassination of Kennedy. Critics of the Warren Commission have accused Johnson of plotting the assassination because he disliked the Kennedys and feared that he would be dropped from the Democratic ticket for the 1964 election. According to journalist Max Holland, the first published allegation that Johnson perpetrated the assassination of Kennedy appeared in Penn Jones Jr.'s book Forgive My Grief, self published in May 1966. In the book, Jones provided excerpts of a letter purported to have been authored by Jack Ruby charging LBJ with the murder of the president. With his 1968 book, The Dark Side of Lyndon Baines Johnson, Joachim Josen is credited by Bugliosi as being the first conspiracy author to accuse Johnson of having a role in the assassination. According to Josen, Johnson played the leading part in a conspiracy that involved the Dallas oligarchy and, local branches of the CIA, the FBI, and the Secret Service. Others who have indicated there was complicity on the part of Johnson include Jim Mars, Ralph D. Thomas, J. Gary Shaw, Larry Harris, Walt Brown, Noel Twyman, Barr McClellan, Craig Zerbel, Philip F. Nelson, and Madeline Brown. The fact that JFK was seriously considering dropping Johnson from the ticket in favor of NC Governor Terry Sanford should Kennedy run in 1964 has been cited as a possible motive for Johnson. Complicity in the assassination. In 1968, Kennedy's personal secretary Evelyn Lincoln wrote in her book, Kennedy and Johnson, that President Kennedy had told her that Lyndon B. Johnson would be replaced as Vice President of the United States. That conversation took place on November 19, 1963, just three days before the assassination of President Kennedy and was recorded that evening in her diary and reads as follows, As Mr. Kennedy sat in the rocker in my office, his head resting on its back he placed his left leg across his right knee. He rocked slightly as he talked. In a slow pensive voice he said to me, You know if I am re-elected in 64, I am going to spend more and more time toward making government service an honorable career. I would like to tailor the executive and legislative branches of government so that they can keep up with the tremendous strides and progress being made in other fields. I am going to advocate changing some of the outmoded rules and regulations in the Congress, such as the seniority rule. To do this I will need as a running mate in 64 a man who believes as I do. Mrs. Lincoln went on to write I was fascinated by this conversation and wrote it down verbatim in my diary. Now I asked, who is your choice as a running mate? He looked straight ahead, and without hesitating he replied, at this time I am thinking about Governor Terry Sanford of North Carolina. But it will not be Lyndon. In 2003, researcher Barr McClellan published the book Blood, Money and Power. McClellan claims that Johnson, motivated by the fear of being dropped from the Kennedy ticket in 1964 and the need to cover up various scandals, masterminded Kennedy's assassination with the help of his friend, Austin attorney Edward A. Clark. 
The book suggests that a smudged partial fingerprint from the sniper's nest likely belonged to Johnson's associate Malcolm Mac Wallace, and that Mac Wallace was, therefore, on the sixth floor of the depository at the time of the shooting. The book further claims that the killing of Kennedy was paid for by oil magnates, including Clint Murchison and H. L. Hunt. McClellan states that the assassination of Kennedy allowed the oil depletion allowance to be kept at 27.5%. It remained unchanged during the Johnson presidency. According to McClellan, this resulted in a saving of over $100 million to the American oil industry. McClellan's book subsequently became the subject of an episode of Nigel Turner's ongoing documentary television series, The Men Who Killed Kennedy. The episode, The Guilty Men, drew angry condemnation from the Johnson family, Johnson's former aides, and former presidents Gerald Ford, who was a member of the Warren Commission, and Jimmy Carter following its airing on the History Channel. The History Channel assembled a committee of historians who concluded the accusations in the documentary were without merit, and the History Channel apologized to the Johnson family and agreed not to air the series in the future. Madeline Brown, who alleged she was the mistress of Johnson, also implicated him in a conspiracy to kill Kennedy. In 1997, Brown said that Johnson, along with H. L. Hunt, had begun planning Kennedy's demise as early as 1960. Brown claimed that by its fruition in 1963, the conspiracy involved dozens of persons, including the leadership of the FBI and the Mafia, as well as prominent politicians and journalists. In the documentary The Men Who Killed Kennedy, Madeline Brown and May Newman an employee of Texas oilman Clint Murchison both placed FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover at a social gathering at Murchison's mansion the night before the assassination. Also in attendance, according to Brown, were John McCloy, Richard Nixon, George Brown, R. L. Thornton, and H. L. Hunt. Madeline Brown claimed that Johnson arrived at the gathering late in the evening and, in a grating whisper, told her that the Kennedys will never embarrass me again. That's no threat. That's a promise. In addition, Brown said that on New Year's Eve 1963, she met Johnson at the Driscoll Hotel in Austin, Texas and that he confirmed the conspiracy to kill Kennedy, insisting that, "...the fat cats of Texas and US intelligence," had been responsible. Brown reiterated her allegations against Johnson in the 2006 documentary Evidence of Revision. In the same documentary, several other Johnson associates also voiced their suspicions of Johnson. Dr. Charles Crenshaw authored the 1992 book JFK, Conspiracy of Silence, along with conspiracy theorists Jens Hansen and J. Gary Shaw. Crenshaw was a third-year surgical resident on the trauma team at Parkland Hospital that attended to President Kennedy. He also treated Oswald after he was shot by Jack Ruby. While attending to Oswald, Crenshaw said that he answered a telephone call from Lyndon Johnson. Crenshaw said that Johnson inquired about Oswald's status, and that Johnson demanded a deathbed confession from the accused assassin Oswald. Crenshaw said that he relayed Johnson's message to Dr. Shires, but that Oswald was in no condition to give any statement. Critics of Crenshaw's allegation state that Johnson was in his limousine at the moment the call would have been made, that no one in his car corroborated that the call was made, and that there is no record of such a call being routed through the White House switchboard. Former CIA agent and Watergate figure E. Howard Hunt accused Johnson, along with several CIA agents whom he named, of complicity in the assassination in his posthumously released autobiography. American Spy, My Secret History in the CIA, Watergate, and Beyond. Referencing that section of the book, Tim Weiner of The New York Times and Joseph C. Gooden of The Washington Times called into question the sincerity of the charges, and William F. Buckley, Jr. 
who wrote the foreword, said material, "...was clearly ghostwritten." Shortly afterwards, an audio taped, "...deathbed confession." in which Hunt claimed knowledge of a conspiracy was released by his sons the authenticity of the confession was also met with some skepticism in 1984 convicted swindler Billy Saul Estes made statements to a grand jury in Texas indicating that he had inside knowledge that implicated Johnson in the death of Kennedy and others. Historian Michael L. Kurtz wrote that there is no evidence suggesting that Johnson ordered the assassination of Kennedy. According to Kurtz, Johnson believed Fidel Castro was responsible for the assassination and that Johnson covered up the truth because he feared the possibility that retaliatory measures against Cuba might escalate to nuclear war with the Soviet Union. In 2012, biographer Robert Caro published his fourth volume on Johnson's career, The Passage of Power, which chronicles Johnson's communications and actions as vice president, and describes the events leading up to the assassination. Caro wrote that, "...nothing that I have found in my research," points to involvement by Johnson. Cuban government conspiracy In its report, the Warren Commission stated that it had investigated "...dozens of allegations of a conspiratorial contact between Oswald and agents of the Cuban government," and had found no evidence of Cuban involvement in the assassination of President Kennedy. The House Select Committee on Assassinations also wrote, the committee believes, on the basis of the evidence available to it, that the Cuban government was not involved in the assassination of President Kennedy." However, some conspiracy theorists continue to allege that Fidel Castro ordered the assassination of Kennedy in retaliation for the CIA's previous attempts to assassinate him. In the early 1960s, Claire Booth Luce, wife of Time Life publisher Henry Luce, was one of a number of prominent Americans who sponsored anti Castro groups. This support included funding exiles in commando speedboat raids against Cuba. In 1975, Claire Luce said that on the night of the assassination, she received a call from a member of a commando group she had sponsored. According to Luce, the caller's name was, "...something like..." Julio Fernandez and he claimed he was calling her from New Orleans. According to Luce, Fernandez told her that Oswald had approached his group with an offer to help assassinate Castro. Fernandez further claimed that he and his associates eventually found out that Oswald was a communist and supporter of Castro. He said that with this new found knowledge, his group kept a close watch on Oswald until Oswald suddenly came into money and went to Mexico City and then Dallas. Finally, according to Luce, Fernandez told her, there is a Cuban communist assassination team at large and Oswald was their hired gun." Luce said that she told the caller to give his information to the FBI. Subsequently, Luce would reveal the details of the incident to both the Church Committee and the HSCA. Both committees investigated the incident, but were unable to uncover any evidence to corroborate the allegations. In May 1967, CIA Director Richard Helms told President Lyndon Johnson that the CIA had tried to assassinate Castro. Helms further stated that the CIA had employed members of the Mafia in this effort, and that CIA plots to assassinate Fidel Castro dated back to August of 1960 to the Eisenhower administration. Helms also said that the plots against Castro continued into the Kennedy administration and that Attorney General Robert Kennedy had known about both the plots and the Mafia's involvement. On separate occasions, Johnson told two prominent television newsmen that he believed that JFK's assassination had been organized by Castro as retaliation for the CIA's efforts to kill Castro. 
In October 1968, Johnson told veteran newsman Howard K. Smith of ABC that, "...Kennedy was trying to get to Castro, but Castro got to him first." In September 1969, in an interview with Walter Cronkite of CBS, Johnson said in regard to the assassination, I could not honestly say that I've ever been completely relieved of the fact that there might have been international connections, and referenced unnamed others. Finally, in 1971, Johnson told his former speechwriter Leo Janos of Time magazine that he never believed that Oswald acted alone." In 1977, Castro was interviewed by newsman Bill Moyers. Castro denied any involvement in Kennedy's death, saying, It would have been absolute insanity by Cuba. It would have been a provocation. Needless to say, it would have been to run the risk that our country would have been destroyed by the United States. Nobody who's not insane could have thought about killing Kennedy in retaliation. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Soviet government conspiracy. The Warren Commission reported that they found no evidence that the Soviet Union was involved in the assassination of President Kennedy. The House Select Committee on Assassinations also wrote the committee believes, on the basis of the evidence available to it, that the Soviet government was not involved in the assassination of President Kennedy." According to some conspiracy theorists, the Soviet Union, with Nikita Khrushchev motivated by having to back down during the Cuban Missile Crisis, was responsible for the assassination. According to a 1966 FBI document, Colonel Boris Ivanov, Chief of the KGB residency in New York City at the time of the assassination stated that it was his personal opinion that the assassination had been planned by an organized group, rather than a lone individual. The same document stated Officials of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union believed there was some well-organized conspiracy on the part of the ultra -right in the United States to effect a «coup». Much later, the high-ranking Soviet bloc intelligence defector, Lt. Gen. Ion Mihai Paispa, said that he had a conversation with Nikolai Ceausescu who told him about Ten international leaders the Kremlin killed or tried to kill, including Kennedy. He claimed that, among the leaders of Moscow's satellite intelligence services, there was unanimous agreement that the KGB had been involved in the assassination of President Kennedy. Paispa later released a book, Programmed to Kill, Lee Harvey Oswald, The Soviet KGB, and the Kennedy Assassination, in 2007. Similar views on the JFK assassination were expressed by Robert Holmes, former First Secretary at the British Embassy in Moscow, in his 2012 book Spy Like No Other. Decoy hearse and wound alteration David Lifton presented a scenario in which conspirators on Air Force One removed Kennedy's body from its original bronze casket and placed it in a shipping casket, while en route from Dallas to Washington. Once the presidential plane arrived at Andrews Air Force Base, the shipping casket with the president's body in it was surreptitiously taken by helicopter from the side of the plane that was out of the television camera's view. Kennedy's body was then taken to an unknown location—most likely Walter Reed Army Medical Center to surgically alter the body to make it appear that he was shot only from the rear part of Lifton's theory comes from a house select committee on assassinations report of an interview of lieutenant richard lipsy on january 18 1978 by committee staff members donald purdy and mark flanagan According to the report, Lieutenant Richard Lipsy said that he and General Welly had met President Kennedy's body at Andrews Air Force Base. Lipsy 
placed the casket in a hearse to be transported to Bethesda Naval Hospital. Lipsy mentioned that he and Welly then flew by helicopter to Bethesda and took the body of JFK into the back of Bethesda. Lipsy said that a decoy hearse had been driven to the front of Bethesda. With Lipsy's mention of a decoy hearse. At Bethesda, Lifton theorized that the casket removed by Lipsy from Air Force One from the side of the plane exposed to television was probably also a decoy and was likely empty. Laboratory technologist Paul O'Connor was one of the major witnesses supporting another part of David Lifton's theory that somewhere between Parkland and Bethesda the president's body was made to appear as if it had been shot only from the rear. O'Connor said that President Kennedy's body arrived at Bethesda inside a body bag in a cheap, shipping type of casket, which differed from the description of the ornamental bronze casket and sheet that the body had been wrapped in at Parkland Hospital. O'Connor said that the brain had already been removed by the time it got to Bethesda, and that there were just little pieces. Of brain matter left inside the skull. Researcher David Rohn dismissed the theory that Kennedy's body was surreptitiously removed from the presidential plane, stating that, as is done with all cargo on airplanes for safety precautions, the coffin and lid were held by steel wrapping cables to prevent shifting during takeoff and landing and in case of air disturbances in flight. According to Rohn, the side of the plane away from the television camera was bathed in Klieg lights, and thousands of persons watched along the fence that bent backward along that side, providing, in effect, a well-lit and very public stage for any would-be body snatchers. <inaudible> <inaudible> Federal Reserve Conspiracy Jim Mars, in his book Crossfire, presented the theory that Kennedy was trying to rein in the power of the Federal Reserve, and that forces opposed to such action might have played at least some part in the assassination. According to Mars, the issuance of Executive Order 11110 was an effort by Kennedy to transfer power from the Federal Reserve to the United States Department of the Treasury by replacing Federal Reserve notes with silver certificates. Actor and author Richard Belzer named the responsible parties in this theory as American billionaires, power brokers, and bankers working in tandem with the CIA and other sympathetic agents of the government." A 2010 article in Research magazine discussing various controversies surrounding the Federal Reserve stated that, "...the wildest accusation against the Fed is that it was involved in Kennedy's assassination." Critics of the theory note that Kennedy called for and signed legislation phasing out silver certificates in favor of Federal Reserve notes, thereby enhancing the power of the Federal Reserve, and that Executive Order 11110 was a technicality that only delegated existing presidential powers to the Secretary of the Treasury for administrative convenience during a period of transition. Israeli government conspiracy Immediately following Kennedy's death, speculation that he was assassinated by a «Zionist conspiracy» was prevalent in much of the Muslim world. Among these views were that Zionists were motivated to kill Kennedy due to his opposition to an Israeli nuclear program, that Lyndon B. Johnson received orders from Zionists to have Kennedy killed, and that the assassin was a Zionist agent. According to Michael Collins Piper in Final Judgment, the missing link in the JFK assassination controversy, Israeli Prime Minister David Ben Gurion orchestrated the assassination after learning that Kennedy planned to keep Israel from obtaining nuclear weapons. Piper said that the assassination was a joint enterprise conducted on the highest levels of the American CIA, in collaboration with organized crime, 
and most specifically, with direct and profound involvement by the Israeli intelligence service, the Mossad. The theory also alleges involvement of Meyer Lansky and the Anti-Defamation League. In 2004, Mordecai Venunu stated that the assassination was Israel's response to pressure Kennedy exerted on Ben Gurion to shed light on Dimona's nuclear reactor in Israel. In a speech before the United Nations General Assembly in 2009, Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi also alleged that Kennedy was killed for wanting to investigate Dimona. Topic: Other published theories. Reasonable Doubt 1985 by Henry Hurt, who writes about his Warren Commission doubts. Hurt pins the plot on professional crook Robert Easterling, along with Texas Oilmen and the supposed Ferry – Shaw Alliance. ISBN 0-03-004059-0 Behold a Pale Horse 1991 by William Cooper alleges that Kennedy was shot by the presidential limousine's driver, Secret Service agent William Greer. In the Zapruder film, Greer can be seen turning to his right and looking backwards just before speeding away from Dealey Plaza. This theory has come under severe criticism from others in the research community. ISBN 0 929385 22 Former Secret Service agent Abraham Baldin's The Echo from Dealey Plaza 2008 ISBN 978 0 307 38201 6 and Kevin James Shea's Death of the Rising Sunday 2017 ISBN 978 1 881 36556 3 Detail plots that occurred shortly before Kennedy's trip to Dallas in 1963, in Chicago and Florida. Within the Secret Service during those chaotic months, rumors were flying about Cuban dissidents and right wing Southerners who were stalking Kennedy for a chance to kill him, Bolden wrote. The security threat in Chicago in early November 1963 involved former Marine Thomas Arthur Valley, who was arrested after police found an M1 rifle, handgun, and 3,000 rounds of ammunition in his vehicle. A high-powered rifle was confiscated from another suspected conspirator in Chicago shortly before Kennedy's trip there was cancelled, Bolden said. Authorities also cited similar threats in Tampa, Florida, and Miami about a week later. Mark North's act of treason, the role of J. Edgar Hoover in the assassination of President Kennedy, 1991 implicates the FBI director. North documents that Hoover was aware of threats against Kennedy by organized crime before 1963, and suggests that he failed to take proper action to prevent the assassination. North also charges Hoover with failure to work adequately to uncover the truth behind Kennedy's murder. ISBN 0 88184 877 8. Mortal Error, The Shot That Killed JFK 1992 by Boner Menninger ISBN 0 alleges that while Oswald did attempt to assassinate JFK and did succeed in wounding him, the shot that struck him in the head was accidentally fired by Secret Service agent George Hickey, who was riding in the Secret Service follow-up car directly behind the presidential limousine. The theory alleges that after the first two shots were fired the motorcade sped up while Hickey was attempting to respond to Oswald's shots and he lost his balance and accidentally pulled the trigger of his R-15 and shot JFK. Hickey's testimony says otherwise. At the end of the last report shot, I reached to the bottom of the car and picked up the R-15 rifle, cocked and loaded it, and turned to the rear. Italics added. George Hickey sued Menninger in April 1995 for what he had written in Mortal Error. 
The case was dismissed as its statute of limitations had run out. The theory received public attention in 2013 when it was supported by Colin McLaren's book and documentary titled JFK, The Smoking Gun ISBN who Shot JFK, A Guide to the Major Conspiracy Theories 1993 by Bob Callahan and Mark Zingarelli explores some of the more obscure theories regarding JFK's murder, such as, "...the Coca-Cola theory". According to this theory, suggested by the editor of an organic gardening magazine, Oswald killed JFK due to mental impairment stemming from an addiction to refined sugar, as evidenced by his need for his favorite beverage immediately after the assassination. ISBN 0-671-79494-9 Passport to Assassination 1993 by Oleg M. Nichiparenko, the Soviet consular official and highly placed KGB officer who met with Oswald in Mexico City in 1963. He was afforded the unique opportunity to interview Oswald about his goals including his genuine desire for a Cuban visa. His conclusions were, 1 that Oswald killed Kennedy due to extreme feelings of inadequacy versus his wife's professed admiration for JFK, and 2 that the KGB never sought intelligence information from Oswald during his time in the USSR as they did not trust his motivations. ISBN 1-55972-210-X Norman Mailer's Oswald's Tale, An American Mystery 1995, concludes that Oswald was guilty, but holds that the evidence may point to a second gunman on the grassy knoll, who, purely by coincidence, was attempting to kill JFK at the same time as Oswald. If there was indeed another shot, it was not necessarily fired by a conspirator of Oswald's. Such a gun could have belonged to another lone killer or to a conspirator working for some other group altogether." ISBN 0-679-42535-7 the Kennedy Mutiny 2002 by Will Fritz not the same as police captain J. Will Fritz, claims that the assassination plot was orchestrated by General Edwin Walker, and that he framed Oswald for the crime. ISBN 0-9721635-0-6 JFK, The Second Plot 2002 by Matthew Smith explores the strange case of Roscoe White. In 1990, Roscoe's son Ricky made public a claim that his father, who had been a Dallas police officer in 1963, was involved in killing the president. Roscoe's widow Geneva also claimed that before her husband's death in 1971 he left a diary in which he claims he was one of the marksmen who shot the president, and that he also killed Officer J.D. Tippett. ISBN 1-84018-501-5 David Roney's The Zapruder Film 2003 concludes that the shot that killed JFK came from in front of the limousine, and that JFK's throat and back wounds were caused by an in and through shot originating from the grassy knoll. Three shots were fired from three different angles, none of them from Lee Harvey Oswald's window at the Texas School Book Depository. Roan is a professor of history emeritus at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point. ISBN 0-7006-1291-2 the Gemstone File, a memoir 2006, by Stephanie Caruana, posits that Oswald was part of a 28-man assassination team that included three U.S. Mafia hitmen Jimmy Fratiano, John Roselli, and Eugene Brading. Oswald's role was to shoot John Connolly. Bruce Roberts, author of The Gemstone File Papers, claimed that the JFK assassination scenario was modeled after a supposed attempted assassination of President F.D. Roosevelt. Roosevelt was riding in an open car with Mayor Anton Cermak of Chicago. 
Cermak was shot and killed by Giuseppe Zangara. In Dallas, JFK was the real target, and Connolly was a secondary target. The JFK assassination is only a small part of the Gemstone Files account. ISBN 1-4120-6137-7. Joseph P. Farrell's LBJ and the Conspiracy to Kill Kennedy 2011 attempts to show multiple interests had reasons to remove President Kennedy, the military, CIA, NASA, anti-Castro factions, Hoover's FBI and others. He concludes that the person that allowed all of these groups to form a coalescence of interests", was Vice President Lyndon Johnson. ISBN 978-1-935487-18-0 In "...allegations of PFC Eugene Dinkin", the Mary Farrell Foundation summarizes and archives documents related to private first class Eugene B. Dinkin, a cryptographic code operator stationed in Metz, France, who went AWOL in early November 1963, entered Switzerland using a false ID, and visited the United Nations press office and declared that officials in the U.S. government were planning to assassinate President Kennedy, adding that, something might happen to the commander-in-chief in Texas. Dinkin was arrested nine days before Kennedy was killed, placed in psychiatric care, deemed a madman, and released shortly thereafter. His allegations eventually made their way to the Warren Commission, but, according to the Farrell Foundation account, the commission took no interest in the matter, and indeed omitted any mention of Dinkin from its purportedly encyclopedic 26 volumes of evidence." Described by the Associated Press as, "...one of the strangest theories." Hugh MacDonald's appointment in Dallas stated that the Soviet government contracted with a rogue CIA agent named, Saul, to have Kennedy killed. McDonald said he worked for the CIA, on assignment for $100 a day, and met, Saul, at the agency's headquarters after the Bay of Pigs invasion. According to McDonald, his CIA mentor told him that, Saul, was the world's best assassin. McDonald stated that after the assassination, he recognized the man's photo in the Warren Commission report and eventually tracked him to a London hotel in 1972. McDonald stated that, Saul assumed he, too, was a CIA agent and confided to him that he shot Kennedy from a building on the other side of the street from the Texas School Book Depository. Torbett, William, 1970 Nomenclature on an Assassination Cabal. The pseudonymous author claimed to be a lawyer with investigative skills working in the South. See the Internet Archive website. <laughs> <laughs> Notes <laughs>